Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. Now say good morning to your neighbor to the left and to the right. This morning, we are um, grateful to God for um, this season, this Easter season that God has brought us into. So we are having a two-part Easter series this this starting from this morning, and then we'll start the next week Sunday, this Easter um, Sunday. Let's invite our friends to church. Um, friends are, you know, neighbors and, and all that. Jesus is our life. So let's humble our hearts and receive it with meekness, the engrafted one of God that is able to save us and give us an inheritance among them that are sanctified. God bless you. Hallelujah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let's say good morning to our neighbors again this morning. And um, it's, I think it's okay for us to say happy Easter. Happy Easter. So today we are um, starting a two-part Easter series, we are looking at subtitle today, What Does Easter Prove? What Does Easter Prove? You see, if you look at the life or the calendar of the Christian, of, of Christianity, and um, the most important day is, is Easter. If you look at it, I mean, the, the most important day is Easter. I mean, it's, it's yeah, we, we like Christmas. Yes, we love Christmas. Christmas is, uh, you could say, the most fun day in, in the Christian calendar or the Christmas season. is the most fun season in, in the Christian calendar. However, it is Easter that is, if you will, the most important season because without the resurrection. There is no, there's no us. Literally, there's, there's, there's really is, is no hope and there's no us. So today we're going to be um, uh, delving into what does Easter prove? What does it prove? The fact that Jesus lived, died, resurrected so what what does it prove <laughs> what does it prove and I'm, and I'm praying that god himself will open our hearts and open our eyes to to see as we ought to see in the name of jesus holy words long prison for our walk in this world, they we sound with God's own part. Oh, let the ancient words be part. Ancient words. chapter 10, verse 18, we're going to read, take our text from John 10, 18. What does Easter prove? Jesus said, no one takes my life away from me. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power 
to take it up again. No one, he says, is about to kill me, or no one can kill me. No one has the power to kill me. If, if, if I'm dying, Jesus is saying, I am voluntarily laying down my life. And that is so, so powerful. So the essence of Easter is a choice. God so loved the world that he gave is he chose to give. Now, he gave us his son. Now, his son is saying that I also had a choice in the matter. I had a choice in the matter. You know, remember in Gethsemane, Jesus was about to face the, 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 the pick of his assignment, if, as it were at the time, to go to the cross. And, and it was a lot for him. And he was struggling. Jesus actually wanted to back down. Oh, yes. I mean, we don't like to think about Jesus in those times. <laughs> but it was tough. You know, he was talking about the cross. I'm going to go to the cross. No, no, the son, day, the son of man is going to rise again. You know, and all that. When the cross came, Jesus said, God, Baba, is it possible that we dodge this one? Is it possible? that this cup passes over me. So, you know, regardless of what you are facing, you may be in a cross situation, a, a, a get some money situation, where you are pressed, where your soul is, is almost crushed. Listen, go to God. God understands Jesus has been there. You, you are in a place where you know this is the direction God wants for you, but <laughs> you would rather be somewhere else or be doing something else. Listen, listen, God has a plan for you, and the plan is irrevocable. So Jesus was saying, I have a choice in the matter. I have a choice in the matter. No one takes my life away. You know, sometimes when you're going through something, and we, we accuse God as though God is forcing us to go through that path. We, 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 we accuse God as though we don't have a choice in the matter. Listen, you always have a choice. As, as long as you are dealing with God, you always have a choice in the matter. You always have a choice. The path that God is leading you through is, is the best part of your life. It may not look like that right now, but listen, it is the best path for your life. When you are going through a, a trying period in that path, it's not a time to start thinking, oh, I wish I wasn't on that path. I wish God will not put this cross on me. I wish, now listen, you have a choice. I mean, that's so powerful. When you come to this realization, your, your attitude changes. Jesus is saying, I have a choice in this matter. When it comes to God, he, the human being, the human part, you know, there's a God part and there's a man part. The man part always has access to his volition. Always. Remember the story of um, Abraham and Isaac. Abraham did not drag Isaac with a rope from the house. No, no, way to the mountain. Isaac asked, oh, Father, I, I see the, 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 the wood, I see the, 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 the fire, I, I see the stones, I see all the other elements of, of a sacrifice. But where is the sacrifice? And God said to him, sorry, and Abraham said to him, the Lord himself will provide. The Lord himself provides. And the boy is not dumb. You know, I mean, obviously he's smart. It's like, when this man is talking like this, there's something he doesn't want to discuss. They go to the point of sacrifice. The sacrifice goes on the altar. And the Bible says that I, Abraham told Isaac to get on the altar. He told him. 
the words you respond to determine the peak and the height of your destiny. God is not going to force you. God doesn't force folks. He doesn't. So, which is why it is, it, is, it is not to your advantage to complain when you have chosen to obey God. If you choose to obey God, you have no business complaining. If you choose to obey God, then stay there because your resurrection and restoration is here already. Restoration is upon you. Hallelujah. Abraham said to him, get on the altar. At that point, it was clear to Isaac that he was the sacrifice. Yes, at that point, it was clear to him. So Isaac, like Jesus, would say, no one takes my life away. Not my father, not my mother, not the servants. No one forced me. In fact, they left the servants behind. No one forced me. I have the power. You always have the power to lay down your life. What is that thing that God is asking you to do? What is the path that God is leading you to do? You always have the power to lay it down. Oh, guess what? And you also have the power to take it up again. It's your choice. So the path you are on, your greatness you experience in God, it's up to you. It's up to you. And your yieldedness to the things of God, it's up to you. No one will force you. No one can force investigate. The basic thing, like, it's not basic, but it's big, but I mean, it's something that we all can relate to. Let's say something like, um, like we, we learned, if you love me, you feed my, my land, right? So you, for you, you, you are serving in Syrac. You have chosen to serve in Sarah. Why complain? Why complain? When you complain, you are extending your day of, of gratuity, if you will, your day of, of reward, your days of resurrection. And since it's resurrection, your day will not be your days will not be prolonged again in the name of Jesus. You have you have the power to fill the form you have the power to sign up for for zero you have done it no one forced you guess what understand that you also have the power to take it off but you won't because you are the child of your father and your reward will not be taken by another so we see that's the dynamics of of, of resurrection jesus was not compelled yeah, he was propelled in the physical when they took him and forced him. It appears that they were forcing him and dragging him to, to, to Golgotha and to, for the sacrifice. However, he said to Peter, don't you think I, have, I can command um, legions of angels to come to my defense? So, so Jesus was saying, I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to bring it back up. So that must tell us that he was on a mission for something that is so big and huge, and that is the salvation and redemption of mankind. So when Jesus went on that path, he was thinking about you. He was thinking about me. So what does Easter prove? What does Easter prove? Jesus going to the cross, what does it prove? The first thing it proves for you and I and for humanity is that Easter proves that God is in control. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, that God is in control. Jesus going to the cross Dying and resurrecting proves that God is in control. The Bible says that he entrusted his life to God, the one that is able to raise him up again from the dead. So at the time Jesus 
was on the cross and he gave up the ghost, he had to trust God. Even though he chose to go that path, he had to trust God for bringing him up and resurrecting him. Guess what? Easter proves that God is in control. The devil is not in control. The people mocking Jesus on the cross, they're not in control. The, the, the demons laughing and rejoicing, they're not in control. That's what we think we got in. It's in control. So we'll be laughing at you. But guess what? They are not in control. They'll be rejoicing, thinking you are going down. Guess what? They are not in control. You may be excited that you are struggling. If you are, guess what? They are not in control. God is in control. Easter proves to us that God is in control. Proverbs 16, 1. Proverbs 16, 1 says to us, we make our plans. But God has the last word. God has the last word. Who has the last word over your life? It's God. Listen, it's not even your emotions. Your emotions don't have the last words over your life. You may feel you are depleted. You may feel it has come to an end. You may feel that you can't survive this. But guess what? Your thoughts are not even in control. Bless with the control. God is in control. And because God is in control, you are resurrecting. Because God is in control, your restoration is here. Because God is in control. You see, you arrive at emotional maturity in your life the moment you realize that most of your life is beyond your control. You attain some spiritual maturity when it is flesh and blood to you that most of your life, the, in fact, the most important critical parts of your life, you are not even in control. God is in control. Guess what? You were not in control of the day you were born. Were you? Were you? Were you in control? You were not, number two, you were not in control of who you were born to, who your, your parents are. You were not in control. You were not in control of where you were born. You were not in control. Even though, in all these factors, if we were to choose, many people would not choose the parents they were born to. He, you know, something that mentioned someone's name that I, I, I would have chosen that person to be my parent. Some, some people will not choose the location they were born into. Eh? Musiolosa. You know? <laughs> you, 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 they will not choose the location. But listen, listen. You are not an accident. God is in control. You will not choose the day you die. You will not even choose the date of your funeral. Do you know that? Do you know that? If Jesus dies, if you go before Jesus comes, you would even decide where you'll be buried. It's not your call. It's not your call. You don't determine, you don't even determine the times you have. You don't determine how tall you are. Do you know that? You don't determine how tall you are. You don't even determine how short you are. You don't determine whether you are light skin, whether you are dark skin, whether you are luscious, whether you are, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know. You don't determine largely your genes, have propensities, and they 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 they, they just run in a certain direction. Of course, nurture also has a place. However, a lot of the things that are major in your life, you have no control over it. Many times, we even think, the only, only thing that I have control over, which is the person you're going to get married to, you will discover that you don't even have control over it. That is the talk for another day. You know, I know folks are like, oh, I'm in control. I chose the person I got married to. 
already. Largely, you will discover that there are other forces at play. But moving on from there, let's look at the obvious ones. When you get to the place where you are realized that this life of my own is actually God's life. I am actually not in control. So that's why people make certain decisions and, and I smile. You, you are so big talking as though you, you are not in control. Did you wake up this morning? No. You slept. Did you know what happened? Why you were sleeping? Apart from you know, some people having funny dreams. You know, you didn't even know where you were. Did you know how you woke up? No idea. That should bring you to a place of stability in your life. Where your life is anchored on the person that is in control. You can lay down and sleep and wake up because the Lord is with you. Your life is devoid of stress completely why because the lord is with you to be jumping that stresses people out stress basically two main things if you, if you can eradicate these two things your life will be stressless your life will be stressless stress is number one is trying to control be uncontrollable. You try to control the uncontrollable. You will be stressed. You are trying to control your children. You can't. They're my children. I will control them. You can't. You are trying to control the things that you can't control. You are trying to control your spouse. Try to control a, a full grown adult. You marry your spouse when they are adult. Full grown. Set in their ways. You want to control them. Don't kill yourself. Don't go to an early grave. You can't control. You can't. Say, but pastor, we, but I have to. No, you can't. You can't. But there's one person that can. And there's one person that can step into every situation. And I pray he steps into your situation in the name of Jesus. But you need to realize that it is God that is in control. That's why it's the first thing. The second thing that stresses people out is the anticipation of not being in control. You know, so they, they look similar, but they're different. The, the first is trying to control the things that are controllable. Guess what? That's, it stresses you out. Relax, you are not in control. God is in control. The second thing is that is the anticipation of not being in control. The anticipation stresses people out. So, so um, you know, they say fear is false evidence appearing real. <laughs> you know, that's a subset of what I'm talking about. So you you are anticipating, oh, you are going to work tomorrow. You're anticipating all oh, that traffic. Guess what? You can't control lucky traffic. You can't. You can leave home early. You can leave home at 4 a.m. You can leave home. To avoid it, but you can't control it. You leave home at 7 p.m., 7 a.m. <laughs> to resume at 18 VI. You know what's going to happen. You can't control it. So the anticipation of sometimes for, for some people is work. All oh, this work is a lot. For some type of for some people is is home, housework. Just the thought that they are going back home. They are stressed out. The thought that, oh, all the house is going to be scattered. As for some people, the end of the month, the anticipation of the end of the month stresses them out. The bills are due. I'm going to pay this. I'm going to pay this. Where is this going to come from? Anticipation of what we are not in control of. You see, at the bottom, at the crux of stress is control. When you realize and cooperate 
with the person that is in control, your life will be stressless. The stress will be diffused. Ephesians 1.20. Ephesians 1.20 says, God's great power is available to help us who believe in him. It is the same mighty power that raised Christ. So you see that. God's great power is what? Available. Available to help us. So God's great power is available to help you in your time of need. God's great power is what? Available to us. So it is so powerful. God is in control. Is not just in control. He's saying to us that at those times when we need him and believe him, that same power, that great power is available. Isaiah 41 10 says to us, don't worry because I am with you. Hallelujah. So the God that is in control is saying, I am with you. Femi, don't worry. <laughs> what gives a man comfort as much as God's presence? He says, by himself, don't worry. Because the person that is in control is saying, don't be stressed out. Because I am with you. Say, God is with me. Everybody say, God is in control and God is with me. Say it again. God is in control and God is with me. So the person that is in control is saying, don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. I will make you strong. And I will help you. I will support you. So you settle that, that God is in control. But then same God is saying to you, don't worry, guess what? It's a secret. I am with you. You know, it's a secret. Don't tell anybody. I am with you. What is the panic? They say, guess what? I'm not just with you. I, I will make you strong. I will help you. I will support you. Hallelujah. God is saying, I will make you strong. I am with you. I will make you strong. I will support you. Then I will help you. Hallelujah. Ah, say after me, I receive God's presence. I receive God's strength. I receive God's help. I receive God's support. So the first thing that Easter proves, the big deal about Easter is that God is in control. Hallelujah. The second big deal about Easter is that God always keeps his promises. Hallelujah. So, number one, he's in control. And he's promised to be with you, to help you, to strengthen you. And guess what? He always keeps his promises. Always. So, Jesus was saying, I'm going to let all these people kill me. And in three days, I'm going to get up again from the dead. And he kept his promise. On the third day, he got up again from the dead. Hallelujah. <laughs> Numbers uh, 23, 19 says, Numbers 23, 19 says, God isn't like people. God is not like people. 
he doesn't change his mind. God is not like people, he doesn't change his mind. When he says something, he does it. When he makes a promise, he keeps it. It's not like people. Have you had people snitch on you? Have you had people turn their back on you? Have you had people, in fact, many times, the experiences, some of our experiences in life is that. But God's word, which I didn't write, which you did not write, is saying to you and I, that God isn't like people. God is not like people. God always keeps his promises. He always keeps his promises. Those promises, like yeah, insurance policies, insurance, you know, insurance work. Once you have insurance policies, once you have the policy in place, boom, you are covered. And that's what they call it. They call it coverage. <laughs> God's promises is like the umbrella, the cover that we have. And God keeps his promises. His coverage is sure. His coverage is solid. It's a protection. I mean, a few days ago, I mean, in here, in Dallas, we had a uh, hail. You can see hail is like what God used to pelt his enemies, you know, in the Bible. I mean, right here, I mean, that was a, quite a bit, I mean, seasonally, that is, you know. But guess what? We were indoors and we were covered. We had a roof over our head. That is how God's promises are. God promises that God, they cover us. They provide a shield around us. They cover us. And, you know, and sometimes, yeah, you know, look at this car. Look at, you know, this car. Some cars were melted. But guess what? The owners don't bother. Because the cars are insured. They are insured. You know, you know, you know, one of the time that, you know, I, I, I had an experience, you know, I mean, here, my car was stationary and, and someone hit my car, you know, I mean, if that had happened, you know, somewhere else that you know, you know, the first thing you hear is, is your fault. Oh, uh, do you know who I am? Oh, uh, you know, sort of bad time is that. And we just, I just, the person just got out of his, of our cars and we exchanged insurance. And immediately the insurance company gave me a substitute car that I didn't have to charge, you know, it was an electric car. I didn't have to charge it. I mean, it was, I think I had to charge it right, but I didn't have to pay for the charge. For the whole period, they took my car brought my car, my car was like brand new. So it was like, it was like the things that I was wishing that, oh, I wish I, I could, you know, do this. They changed everything. My car was like brand new, they brought it back. Then they, they took their loaner car, the substitute car. So I was covered. And because I was covered, I didn't bother. I didn't bother that, oh, you, you don't eat my car, or you don't like my car, you know that sort of thing. <laughs> it's not about, it's when you are covered, you don't stress. Number one, if you are in, your car is in the garage, you are, you, are, you, are, you are under the roof, that's the best place to be. But guess what, even if your car is outside, and it was pelted by the hill, even your roof, people are getting complete roof replacements. Because they are covered. So the hill, people are changing their roofs. That's why advertisement about roof repair goes up after the hill. Because people have insurance and they are covered. And the word of God is our coverage. The word of God covers us, covers us. And when we realize that we are stronger 
we are better. So Matthew eleven twenty eight says to us, are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? <laughs> Jesus is not about religion. Nah. He says, come to me for your rest and I will recover your life and you will learn to live freely and lightly. Come to me for your life and I will recover it because I always keep my promises. I always keep my promises. So the, the first thing that Easter proves that God is in control. It's in control. The second thing that it proves, it proves that God always keeps his promises. So Easter proved and continues to prove that God always keeps his promises. And the third thing that Easter proves, are you ready for this? The third thing that Easter proved, I mean, the, 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 the first two are big. This is huge. Okay, it's also as huge. <laughs> you know, they all are big. This is huge. The third thing that Easter proves is that you are not forgotten. Hallelujah. Easter proves that you are not forgotten. Easter proves that Olufemi Mone is not forgotten. Easter proves that I will, not only am, am I not forgotten, I will not be forgotten. I will not be forgotten. You know, I was listening to uh, some guy, a friend of mine, uh, his, his feed came on my uh, timeline. Um, sometimes he does, sometimes, I mean, he doesn't. Because... I follow him, but sometimes I don't get his feet. And uh, but this day, his feet came on my timeline, and he was saying that we will all be forgotten. You know, and he pretty much had a point, you know. And his point was: no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how famous you are, you will be forgotten. No matter, even people are forgetting people that are alive. They are alive, but they've forgotten them. Talkers of people that have passed. And it, it went to a great extent to prove that we will all be forgotten. Certain historical figures that you would not have imagined would be forgotten today. Classic example he gave was Larry King. I mean, if you if you, you know Larry King, like if you don't know Larry King, <laughs> you know I mean, Gen Z people they don't know Larry King. But Larry King was in control of of the mic. Today, if you go on YouTube, and I did it myself, put Larry King and such, you will not see Larry King's show on YouTube. He's some guy that almost has a million followers. So. Nice looking Gen Z guy. <laughs> so when you talk to this generation about Larry King, that's the guy they know. It is almost unbelievable that a time will come, not even after our lifetime, in our lifetime, that Larry King will be forgotten. He is forgotten. And on and on and on, he gave examples and he proved it. I mean, he has a point. He has a point that one thing about people is that human beings move on. That's why, no matter what you're going through, don't kill yourself. People will move on. People think that the, the whole world is going to be on your matter for 24 for so People will move on. Some of them will die. Some of them will be forgotten. The ones that refuse to be forgotten. They will be buried. You know, at the end of the day, nobody remembers you anymore. And he has a point. He has a point. And while that is the lot of 
humanity generally. The limitation of that thought and that argument is that that thought did not factor in God's position. Hallelujah. It didn't, it didn't factor in God's position. Guess, guess what God said? God said that I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. God will never forget you. You know, sometime last week also, I, I mean, we lost a friend. Uh, you know, I mean, it, I, I, I'm, I was really heartbroken. I mean, many of us know who I'm talking about. If you don't know who we're talking about, you see, what I, that's what I'm saying. I mean, you forgot to him so quickly. It's, I mean, in our journey as a church, I mean, it was a part of the journey. And we became personal friends. We played tennis together. We, you know, it's gone. I mean, if this are not, I mean, if, if we're to choose people that should go, you know, I know that if we're to vote on who should go, it's not people like that that should be going. At least at this stage. I mean, you know, perfect, but it's a great soul. It's a great soul. It's a great soul. And, and it's, 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 it's made me, do, I mean, forced me to do a lot of thinking. We do this, we amass this, we build that, we just, boom, we are gone. And so it's very instructive. That's why Jesus says it is better to go to the house of mourning than the house of rejoicing or festivities. Why? Because you consider the end of all men. You know, it, it was very sobering. Very sobering for me. In fact, there was a time, a time during the week that I... I I went to, to my closet to get something and I was standing in the closet. I was lost in thoughts about this, my friend. I was, I can't remember how long I was in the closet. I was just staring, thinking about him, thinking about him, thinking about me. And my heart was heavy. Then I'm like, what am I doing? Where am I? What did I come here for? At that point, God spoke to me. Now, listen, uh, it's so sweet to, to, for God to love you and to, to have fellowship with you. I mean, it's so, 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 so. And, and I will tell you what he said to me. And he said to me, he mentioned his name. And he said to me that, is with me and is happy with me. I mean, he said that. Scriptures just began to come to my mind. Boom, 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 boom. Now listen, it wasn't a case of I was sad. Then I was using scriptures to try and encourage myself. And I'm, I was quoting that, those scriptures. Then I now believe that, oh, he's in a good place. He's in a better place. No, that was not what happened. I was... There, I was lost in thought. I was, my heart was heavy about my friend. Lost friend. And God said to me, he's okay. He's fine. He's happy. He's with me. I'm like, wow, he is. He is. Hallelujah. He is. And he's well on one hand. I'm like, what will happen to his children? What will happen to his family? What will happen to his wife? What will happen to all he's labored for? What will happen? I'm not sure he has the succession planning sorted out. What will happen? But the most important thing is what will happen to him. And the Lord said, he's with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, can you imagine how I came out of the closet? I was, I was joyful, you know, knowing that. You see, we will not be forgotten. 
We have never forgotten. A while ago, you can go to that same location of where his complex is, and people don't remember him anymore. People don't remember him anymore. You can go to the same tennis court, and people don't even remember him anymore. But guess what? He's never forgotten. God has him in his bosom. He is never forgotten. We are never forgotten. So don't live life thinking, oh, we'll all be forgotten anyway. No, 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 no. We will not all be forgotten. No. We will not all be forgotten. If you are going to be forgotten, mm, say that about yourself. But I will not be forgotten. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, and that's why Paul will say in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, um, he says in verse 19 that if our hope in Christ is only for this life, if it's only about the monuments we build, the, the, our, uh, our legacies that we have established are, he says, we are of all men. We are more to be pitied than anyone else in the world. But this God is saying to you, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isaiah 49, from verse 14, it says, Yet Jerusalem say that the Lord has deserted us. The Lord has forgotten us. But here God's response, never. God says, never. Never. That never is with that exclamation mark. Never. We are never forgotten. We are never forgotten. He says, can a mother forget his nursing child? Can a mother forget his nursing child? Can, can she feel no love for the child she has born? He says, but if that were possible, as, as much as that looks impossible, even if that were possible, he says, I would not forget you. Oh, God is saying that, I will not forget you, Femi. I will not forget you. Put your name there. I will not forget you. I can't forget you. You are mine. I can't. He says, see, I have written your name on the palms of my hand. They may wipe up your name from the history of men, but your name, your name is in the palm of my hands. Always in my mind is a picture of your walls always in my mind and he's saying your restoration is here soon your children will come back to you and all who are trying to destroy you will be wiped away says so look around you and see for all your children will come back to you. Surely as I live, says the Lord, they will be the, like jewels and bridal ornaments for you to display. So God is saying, history may forget, but I will not forget. Man may forget, but I will not forget. So not only is God in control, not only does God keep his promises, God will not forget you. That's what Easter proves. He says, you will not leave my soul in Hades. He will not forget me in hell. Jesus rose again, proves that God will not forget you. God will come back for you. God has not forgotten you. And God will never forget you. He says, your names, your name is written on the palm of my hand. In other words, when you look at God's hand, 
Lucie, on nous fait mi. Mon Oh, it's that cute. You know, but I tattooed my name on your palms. I'm not sure you've seen any tattoo in anybody's palms. We don't want to get into the reason why people can't and do not to put tattoos in their hands. But guess what? God says, I'm going to put a tattoo of your name on the palm of my hand. I can never, 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 ever forget you. Hallelujah. That's the story of Easter. That's what Easter proves. Easter proves that God will never forget you. So, you know, if you're here, you're like, Pastor, I want God to be with me. I want God to make me strong. I want God to help me. I want God to support me. And you pray with me. Yes, I want to pray with you. This God is saying to you, I will not forget you. Wherever you are, we want to pray with you right now. Um, the, the app is going to come up to, to wrap it all up. But I want to challenge you. You are like, Pastor, I've heard this amazing word of God. I'm going to respond. There's no day like today. Guess what? Your name can be written also in the book of life and written in the palm of God. That is me. Oh, you're like, Pastor, I used to be with God. I'm not with God anymore. Can I come back? Can I make today that day? Yes, you can, my brother. Yes, you can, my sister. I want to come back. I want to come back to him. I see the purpose of Easter. And I see what Easter proves. Pray with me, wherever you are, wherever you are. That is you. Pull up your hand now, over your head. If you are online, instructions are scrolling on what to do. But if you are in the auditorium, pull up your hand now, over your head. And we'll pray together. God bless you.